so share screen. Few more seconds to go. Okay, now it's time. So let us get started. So this is the sixth lecture in this course, and we have already come a long way. And uh, the, based on a doodle poll, we decided to hold office hours on Fridays, five to six. But just today, I have a conflict, so I have to move it to three to four p.m. So uh, uh, if you can make this time slot, I, I apologize. But in that case, you can either post questions on a piazza or uh, uh, send me email. So uh, hopefully, I can take care of that. But anyway, so today I hold the office hour from three to four. And also, just in case you haven't noticed, I have been trying to post slides uh, in PDF before the lecture starts. So for example, if you look at the syllabus today, uh, uh, then you can find the link to the slides and you can download it and, and, and look at it your own. And that might help you to, for example, look back on the previous slide to make sure that you understand the flow of the arguments uh, in, in the lecture. So that's something I just wanted to remind you. Okay. so. So the, the first week we uh, reviewed uh, the harmonic oscillator in quantum mechanics. In second week, we used harmonic oscillator to, to sort of build up the quantum field theory from scratch in sort of a heuristic fashion by just by declaring that the uh, creation annihilation operator can literally create or annihilate particles at a given position, then took the continuum limit. And that's how we came up with the Schrodinger field theory. And to make everything that that's sort of uh, uh, totally connected in one to one. So now we are doing the other way around, namely, suppose you are given this Lagrangian, then you are trying to figure out what this means. And then we are trying to reproduce multi-particle quantum mechanics out of this Lagrangian. Then you can go this way, you can also go that way. So then you know that the, everything is in one to one correspondence to make sure that the quantum field theory has identical physics content as the multi-particle quantum mechanics. So that's what we are trying to do uh, today. We briefly started this discussion on Wednesday. Now we're trying to finish that up. So you are given this Lagrangian, then what are you supposed to do? And as you always the case, once you're given the Lagrangian, the first thing is to set up the canonical commutation relation. So Lagrangian, you differentiate it with the time derivative of the variable. So in this case, psi field is the variable. So psi dot is there. You differentiate it with respect to psi dot. No other terms have psi dot in it. So this is the only piece you need to look at then. Then you will identify IH by psi dagger to be the canonically conjugate momentum. So then you know psi is Q, psi dagger is P, you write down the canonical computation relation, QP commutator is IH bar. And so IH bar can be canceled from both sides. So that's how you came up with this commutation relation, psi X, psi dagger Y commutator is delta X minus Y. And once you see it, then you say, aha, this is the same form of the commutation relation as the creation annihilation operator. So now you can identify psi as the annihilation operator psi dagger as the creation operator. So that allows you to define the Hamiltonian now, because once you have PQ defined, the Hamiltonian is PQ dot minus L. So PQ dot precisely cancels this one, minus L, all the rest of the terms which they assign, and now you know the Hamiltonian. So now that you identified also the annihilation creation operator, you can define the vacuum state, analogous to the ground state in the harmonic oscillator, which is annihilated by the annihilation operator psi of x at every x, that's an important point. So this is satisfied for any x in this space. Then you can start building the uh, uh, excited states of the system by acting the creation operator on the vacuum state to create particle at position one, a particle at positions x1 and x2, this is a three particle state at positions x1, x2, x3, and so on and so forth. So that's how you can build up your Hilbert space. So now you have all ingredients in theory. You have commutation relation, you have Hamiltonian, you have Hilbert space. Then you can start analyzing an arbitrary state in its time evolution using the Schrodinger equation. And of course, we know in quantum mechanics, 
you have this very funny idea that a particle can exist at different positions at the same time. And this is, of course, really weird thing about quantum physics. But nonetheless, that's something we have to describe. That's you have to take the linear superposition of particles at particular positions x1 to xn. Now, taking linear superposition with this probability amplitude capital psi, as, which is a function of xy to xn. And this uh, 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 probability amplitude capital psi ends up being the uh, uh, wave function uh, in the case of the quantum mechanics. So, so that's how you are now reproducing the multiple particle quantum mechanics. And one important operator here is the number operator n, which is psi dag of psi. And they, we know that in the case of harmonic oscillator, number operators a dagger a. If you have many harmonic oscillators, you sum over the subscripts a i dagger a i. And in this case, the subscript is actually positioned in space. So you sum over it and sum of course for the continuous variable is done by integral. So that's why ddx, uh, the dx of psi dagger x psi x is the total number of particles in the entire space. So that's the uh, ingredients we get immediately out of this Lagrangian. So then we are trying to verify that this capital Psi has the right time evolution consistent with the usual Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics, then you are done. So then you know that the QFD is really the same thing as the multi-particle uh, quantum mechanics, but except that the, uh, the quantum statistics of identical particles is now built in. Okay, so this is what we are trying to do. We started this, but now I'm re reading the whole thing again to make sure that that sinks into uh, everybody's mind. So let me pause here to see if there are any questions on what we're trying to do. I have a question about um, the vacuum state mm -hmm. and Go how ahead. if you act the annihilation operator on it, it goes to zero. Mm -hmm. um, is that doesn't make like intuitive sense to me. Oh, um, I, I can't tell if it's forced um, or if it's actually provable. Ah, so that's an excellent question. So here, uh, this is the way I define the vacuum state, but it doesn't necessarily tell you that this is the ground state, right? So these are actually okay. two different notions. So when I say vacuum state, what's meant by this is that this is a state with no particles in it, hence the name mm -hmm. vacuum. So you can see immediately that using this number operator, which has psi on the right, if you act this number operator on this state, then by definition, psi acts directly on the state, which is uh, 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 which vanishes. So you see that this state is an eigenstate of a number operator with eigenvalue zero. So that's what I mean that this is a state that does not have any particles in it, hence the vacuum. So it's but, it's eigenvalue zero, and that's mm -hmm. that's allowed. It just it's it seems like maybe there's some sort of conservation principle that's being broken by it just disappearing, um, but I guess it's not. Okay, so so number operator is actually conserved. So one thing uh, you can do is to take the commutator of number and Hamiltonian operators, and show that it vanishes, and if an operator commutes with Hamiltonian operator, and that quantity is conserved because okay. there's no time evolution to yeah. it. So number operator is conserved, but psi mm -hmm. operator doesn't commute with N because it changes N, just like creation addition operator in harmonic oscillator. So that's why this definition may look odd because the, this, this operator does change the number but it's not that the number operator is not conserved because it still does commute with the Hamiltonian. What is not conserved in some sense is the Psi. And uh, that's also true in harmonic oscillator. A doesn't commute with Hamiltonian because it changes the energy. A dagger doesn't commute with Hamiltonian because it changes energy. So Psi is not a conserved operator. It changes with time. Uh, well, uh, in, in Heisenberg picture, I have to apologize, but the N is conserved. So there's nothing that violates the number conservation here. Okay. So, but on the other hand, we will be asking the question whether this vacuum state is the ground state of the system. And that's a different question because then you have to minimize the Hamiltonian. 
So we will get to that question probably next week when we start talking about Bose-Einstein condensate of cold atoms. It turns out that this vacuum state is not the ground state of the system in that case. Instead, you have to find the ground state to be this condensate of the, the, the collection of particles. So the vacuum may not mean this is the lowest energy state. We will get back and talk about the situation later on. But right now, at least when this, uh, the repulsive force lambda is positive, then it turns out that this is actually the, the ground state as well. So, so far, there is no contradiction between the vacuum state and ground state, but there are examples where they are not. And, and we will talk about that later. Okay. Is that okay, Natalie? Thank you. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? I had a question. Go um, ahead. So we're looking at how this is um, sort of analogous to quantum mechanics so far, except you said for the, the sim, um, symmetric particles are like built in. Hmm? What is the analog of the repulsion term that we added in the quantum mechanics that we've already seen? Yeah, yeah. so you, you will see that in a moment. So uh, I, I, you, you will definitely see what it actually oh. means in quantum mechanics. Okay, any other questions? So just to remind you, this we got this term by taking a continuum limit of repulsive potential among particles when they come to the same site. So the naive guess is that this is sort of the delta function potential among particles uh, with the repulsion, namely positive uh, uh, lambda. And indeed, that is actually what is go going to uh, uh, come out from this uh, uh, Hamiltonian. So you will see that explicitly. Any other questions? Um, okay. Oh, go ahead. So, like, the uh, you could use creation operators for like fermions as well, right? Yes. Or, but not this one. Like, so for fermions, we yeah, have to set up a different commutation relation. Yeah, but like, if you started with the vacuum state and then you made like like an electron, mm -hmm. wouldn't that mean that charge isn't conserved? Yeah, so again, uh, it's the same question Natalie asked actually. So in that case, you define the charge operator, which basically looks like this, maybe number of electron times E. And charge commutes with the Hamiltonian, so charge is conserved. But psi field operator can change the number of electrons. So the electron field, is not conserved and, and charge uh, is conserved, but you can change charge in the same way that the creation annihilation operator can change energy, but of course energy is conserved. So it is totally normal to have operators in your quantum system that can change conserved quantities. You can change energy, you can change charge, you can change the number of particles, you can change angular momentum, you know, for example, the raising lowering operator of angular momenta can change the angular momentum, even though angular momentum is conserved. So you already have seen plenty of operators which can change conserved quantities. Having those operators in your uh, 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 the Hilbert space does not mean certain things are not conserved. So they are two different things. Does that answer your question, Dan? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. All right, so let me just get to it. So one thing we wanna verify is that the state you create with one creation operator is indeed the eigenvalue of the number operator with number one. So this is something you have seen already, but let me just go through this once again. So I act number operator on this state to see if it has an eigenvalue one. So I just literally acted on here and I change the dummy variable integral from x to y to avoid the class of notation. And then because psi, if it acts directly on the vacuum state, it gives you identically zero. I can replace this psi psi dagger, the product of two operators by a commutator because the second term in a commutator has psi acting directly on the ground state that identically vanishes. So going from the first line to second line, I just added zero so I haven't changed anything. 
But now that we know what this coming data is, which is just a delta function, I can use that over here. Then I can integrate y, integrate over y by replacing y by x everywhere. And th there's only one occurrence of y in the integrand. So this y gets replaced by x. So here's the end result. And by comparing the leftmost hand side and the rightmost hand side, you see that number operator is one acting on the state. So you see that this is indeed the eigenstate of the number operator with eigenvalue one. So that's why we can interpret this state psi dagger x acting on a vacuum state as the state with one particle. So again, responding to questions by Natalie and Dance. So psi dagger does change number, but it doesn't mean that number is not conserved. Number is conserved in our case, it commutes with the Hamiltonian, but you have an operator which can change the conserved quantity, just like raising, lowering operator and angular momentum. And, and this is important because at the end of the day, we will talk about the processes where number of particles does change. So in that case, number of particles is not conserved, like number of photons from atomic emission. And then you are now allowed to talk about such a process because you have that kind of operator built in to your formulation of the quantum field theory. So without that, we will never be able to talk about processes where number of particles can change. So right now we are dealing with a system where number of particles is conserved, but having this operator, which can change the number of particles built into the system, we will be able to talk about systems where number of particles is not conserved. And that's the benefit of QFT because we know the photon can be created and destructed in experiments. And we now have a tool to be able to describe that. So we are preparing for it, even though right now we are not talking about a process where number can change. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Any questions about this? And as I said already, in general, a particle state, one particle state is linear superposition of the position eigenstates. That's why you introduce this coefficient function, namely capital Psi as a function of X and T. So this coefficient now depends on T in general because the state can depend on T ensuring a picture. Operators do not depend on T ensuring a picture. So I take a linear superposition of this uh, the state with a particle at definite position X and you take linear superposition to make sure that the particle can exist at different positions at the same time. This is still counterintuitive to most of us, male mortals, but that's what quantum physics is about. So that's the way we can describe such a situation. Okay, uh, questions? Yeah, presumably this is fairly clear. So now we start testing this quantum field theory to see if this really makes sense by studying the time evolution of the state. So just like in any quantum systems, this time evolution of the state is given by the Hamiltonian. So I mentioned this at the beginning of the course that the Hamiltonian is an operator that pushes time forward. So that's, that's the meaning of the Schrodinger equation, which you have seen in quantum mechanics class. So we apply the same idea. So we now prepare the state psi of t, that's the ket, defined this way for one particle state as a linear superposition of the state with definite possession. We know what the Hamiltonian is and that was derived from the Lagrangian top down. So we just literally act this Hamiltonian on this state to identify how this state evolves in time. So here we go, the time evolution of the state of this state as defined here where time dependence is in this coefficient function capital Psi. So time derivative would act only on this capital Psi. So that's the left-hand side of this Schrodinger equation. Now we work out the right-hand side of the Schrodinger equation by acting this Hamiltonian on the, uh, the uh, state you got. And to work this out, somehow I got the animation in wrong order. Uh, we used the fact we used on a previous slide already Namely, when you have psi, psi dagger acting on the vacuum state, I can replace this product by the commutator. 
because the second term in commutator has the annihilation operator acting on the vacuum state directly that vanishes identically. So going from the first expression, the second expression, I'm just adding zero to it. So nothing changes. But now that this is the commutator, I know what it is, namely it's a delta function. So I'm gonna actually take, uh, uh, make use of this fact. When you have something a little bit more complicated, which shows up with this Hamiltonian, I have psi dagger first acting on the vacuum state that creates one particle. But with the next psi that would annihilate the particle, now it has a zero particle in it. And if you further act annihilation operator on it, you can go to negative one particle, so that's zero. So in the, in the case of the harmonic oscillator, this is the creation. So zero goes to one, one goes to zero, and you can't lower zero anymore, hence the whole thing is zero. So that is actually a useful thing to know. And that ends up what we are gonna use when I act this, uh, the, this lambda term on the state we have. So the first one is simple. I have psi, and psi dagger. And using the property of this line over here, I replace psi psi dagger by the commutator without changing it, that turns into delta function. So I use the delta function here and I'm still left with X and Y integrals. So at the end of the day, all the Y's get replaced by X. So that's the first term, that's easy. Second term is also easy. So I have again, psi dagger psi acting on psi dagger. I change this psi psi dagger by a commutator that turns into delta function. What remains is V times psi dagger, that's right here. Again, at the end of the day, Y gets replaced by X using delta function. And the third term is where this second identity is, is useful, where you start with a vacuum state, you create one particle, you annihilate two, you can't do that, hence zero. So that's the fact we use over here. So this term actually doesn't do anything and hence zero over here. And finally, I do the Y integral. And in order to perform Y integral, I don't want to have this derivative acting on psi dagger operator. So I do integration by parts in Y and assuming boundary terms can be dropped. Then this derivative now acts on this uh, coefficient function capital psi. So the end result is this. So two derivatives integrated by parts, you change the sign twice. So at the end of the day, sign doesn't change. Y is integrated using delta function. So there's no Y left. This is a typo, I, I probably have to fix that. So this is meant to be X now, sorry. And the derivative and potential is now multiplying this function capital psi. So that's the end result of the right-hand side. So now and I compare left-hand side of the equation in the Schrodinger equation, that's this one. And one particle state is multiplied by IH bar DDT psi. Right-hand side of the Schrodinger equation is this one. And one particle state is multiplied by this combination over here. And because they're meant to be equal, these things in the yellow boxes are meant to be equal then you can see that this is clearly the familiar equation, namely the Schrodinger equation of a point particle, single particle in a potential V. So that's how you have reproduced the one particle quantum mechanics out of quantum field theory. So this is the beginning of this test that the quantum field theory as given by the Lagrangian, suppose that's a God given Lagrangian, you don't know what it means, but now you start to make sense out of it namely that this seems to describe the one particle quantum mechanics as a part of the system coming from this quantum field theory. Okay, let me pause here to see uh, if there are any questions about this. Okay. Yeah, so this is what I said. We derived one particle Schrodinger equation from QFT. Any questions? Okay, so the next thing obviously is we move up to the two particle case. And the two particle case is actually your no, no, uh, next homework problem. So uh, watch carefully and ask questions in the meantime. So again, we have this number operator and we create two particles by using creation operator twice acting on the vacuum state. 
the first thing to make sure that this is indeed an eigenstate of the number operator with the eigenvalue two. And this is a typo again. I, I, I didn't mean to have this, uh, the, the vertical bar over here. So forget these things, I should correct that later. So it's just that I'm acting this number operator on this state and to see if number operator really does have the eigenvalue two. And in general, then of course, uh, uh, we have to uh, take the linear superposition of the two particle state with this uh, 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 the coefficient function capital Psi. So the first thing we check is that this is already a, uh, uh, a symmetric uh, function because two Psi daggers commute with each other. Psi and Psi dagger don't commute when they are the same positions, but Psi Psi always commute, Psi dagger Psi dagger always commute. So I can interchange the order between these two Psi dagger operators. So I used to have Psi dagger X1, Psi dagger X2 in this order, but I can interchange them to Psi dagger X2, Psi dagger X1. But X1 and X2 are dummy variables of this integral. So I can relabel dummy variables. So I call X1 instead by X2, I call X2, instead by x1, so I just switch the dummy variables. Then this x2 becomes this x1, this x1 becomes this x2, this x1 becomes this x2, this x2 becomes this x1. So from here to there, I did not change anything. I just relabeled the dummy variables of this integral. But after relabeling, what I find is that the state part of this expression is the same as the first one. I have psi dagger x1, psi dagger x2 acting on the vacuum state. So then what it means is that the coefficient has to be the same as well, namely that this function capital psi doesn't change when you interchange two arguments, x1 and x2. So this is already a symmetrized wave function. So this psi ends up having the meaning of the wave function of two particle state, but this is already symmetric under the interchange of two particles, which goes back to the point that psi diagonal operators commute at different positions. So the symmetrization of the wave function for identical particles is automatically built in to QFT. So this is already one point where QFT is better than the quantum mechanics because you don't have to impose the symmetry of the wave function by hand, like what you used to do in quantum mechanics. The QFT tells you this, this, this function is symmetric uh, 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 as a consequence. So the symmetric wave function for identical particles is what comes out of the QFT automatically. So that's really an advantage over the quantum mechanics. And I realized that I probably am not showing that number operators eigenvalue is indeed two, uh, but all you have to do is to do this commutation relation just twice instead of once. You commute this psi and psi dagger, and that gives you delta function. And then you move on, then you commute psi and psi dagger as a second commutator that gives you yet another one. So they add up, add up to two at the end of the day, so that you can confirm that this is an eigenstate of the number operator with the eigenvalue two. Okay, so any questions about this slide? Nope. Silence sometimes is kind of scary. <laughs> is everybody okay? Guys, I'm distracted by the squirrel in Jerry's screen. I thought it was real. Oh, what is what is the screen? Coming? Is it... I thought he was actually outside and that that was a real squirrel. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a picture, right? I pointed that out last time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so cute. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now I got your attention back, I hope. <laughs> and is everything okay, Natalie? <laughs> yeah, everything's fine. I think I got okay, it. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So once again, we do this test. If this capital Psi really does make sense as a two particle wave function, 
And that is where I hope to answer Osho's question, namely that this term here now comes into play and that really does end up having the meaning of the repulsive potential among particles. So what we are supposed to do is the same idea. So the left-hand side of the Schrodinger equation is that the time dependence appears only in this function capital Psi. Operators don't depend on time in the Schrodinger picture we are using right now. So the time derivative just acts on this capital Psi. So that's it. That's the left-hand side of the equation. Now we look at the right-hand side of the equation that is a little bit more messy because there are now uh, more things to do uh, for the two-particle state. But uh, please watch carefully now because you are supposed to do this yourself. Okay. So for the first two terms, both terms have the structure that you have psi on the right, psi dagger and rest on the left. So I factored whatever is on the left of psi inside this parenthesis. And then I have psi of y on the right. And I use psi of y to move to the right if I move it all the way to the right, acting directly on the vacuum state, that of course gives you zero by definition of the vacuum state. So what I have is psi here, psi dagger, psi dagger. So first thing I do is to write psi psi dagger as commutator psi psi dagger plus psi dagger psi. The commutator AB is AB minus BA, if I add BA back in, then that's the same thing as the original AB. So I'm changing Psi Psi dagger to Psi Psi dagger commutator plus Psi dagger Psi. Then the commutator piece becomes this total function. Then I'm left with Psi dagger here, Psi in between and Psi dagger acting on the vacuum state. Then I do the same trick again. I have psi here, psi dagger there. I write that as a commutator plus psi dagger psi. And what I added back in has psi acting directly on the vacuum state. So that's identically zero. I can drop that. What I'm left with is only commutator that turns into this delta function. So that's the usual trick. Whenever I have psi and I have a bunch of psi dagger here, I just rewrite psi psi dagger in terms of commutator and add psi dagger psi back in to make sure I don't change anything. But using this commutator multiple times, I keep turning these field operators into delta function. And each time I do so, I move psi operator to the right and go over psi dagger. And each time I go over psi dagger, I keep generating this delta function. But at the end of the day, psi ends up acting directly on the vacuum state that's identically zero. So that's how I can take this psi all the way to the right and I end up with this expression. So that's how you can take care of the first two terms. And, and you're gonna do that yourself. So, so, so if, you, if it was not clear to, to you right now, please ask questions. So that's how I took care of the first two terms. Now I need to take care of the last term, which is new for this two particle state. So now that we have two particle state, I created one particle with this creation operator, second particle with the second creation operator. So I have two particles here. Then I annihilated one, I'm down to one particle. I annihilated once more, I'm down to zero particle. So this is not the state that vanishes. This is the vacuum state now. Then I build back two particles by using these creation operators. So I end up with two particle state again. So this term doesn't vanish anymore, unlike the one particle case we studied on the previous slide. So it remains. So I play the same trick. I move this psi going over this psi dagger. And that, then that creates this delta function. And I move the other psi also going over psi dagger that creates another delta function. So if you follow through the trick I mentioned, then you can show that this psi psi, psi dagger psi psi dagger ends up being the product of two delta functions. Okay. Then I try to perform y integral, like what I did for the one particle case. 
and y integral with the delta function, of course, substitutes the argument of delta function into y. So for the first term with this delta function, delta y minus x1, I substitute x1 into y everywhere. So that gives this delta, uh, the derivative now as a derivative with respect to x1. This potential is also the potential with respect to x1. And I did the integration by parts so that this derivative acting on the field operator now acts on this coefficient function capital of psi without changing the sign because I do integration by parts twice. So that's what I get from this first delta function. I do the same thing for the second delta function. So I substitute x2 into y. So this derivative is now the respect to x2. Integration by parts is now x on capital psi, but the derivative is still with respect to x2. Second term in the parentheses with the potential x2 substitutes y. So this turns into v of x2. Now I have taken care of all the terms in the first line here. And the third term with this lambda coefficient have two delta functions. So I substitute x1 into y. And that happens even into this delta function. So this y is now replaced by x1 using the first delta function. So this second delta function now remains as a delta function between x1 and x2. And then these, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the creation operators is still there. So at the end of the day, you find this expression. So if you compare the left-hand side of the equation, I have this two particle state multiplied by this time derivative of capital Psi. Right-hand side of the equation, I have the two particle state multiplied by this whole thing where this everything inside parentheses is acting on this function capital Psi. So they are supposed to be the same again. Then I find this equation, which is precisely the two particle Schrodinger equation. So minus h bar squared two m derivative squared is p one squared over two m for the particle one. Minus h bar squared two m derivative respect to x two squared is p two squared over two m. So I have kinetic energies for particle one and particle two. Both of them move in the same potential. So they feel potential at their respective positions. So V of X one and V of X two. But in addition, we have something new here, namely these two particles actually interact with each other with this delta function potential. So when they come together to the same position, they repel because lambda is positive. And that's the term Osho was looking for. Now it's there. So now you see the meaning of the last term in the Lagrangian. It has the meaning of the delta function repulsive potential among particles. So that's the general situation with the second uh, this two particle state. You have kinetic energy of two particles. You have potential energies for each particle. Then you have interactions among particles. And that's the two particle Schrodinger equation, including external force from the potential and internal interaction among particles in the system. So now, once again, we recovered quantum mechanics from QFT. But here again, quantum mechanics, you have to specify the number of particles ahead of the time so that you know what wave function you are dealing with. But in QFT, it's only part of the game. It's not the whole game. You can build one particle state, you can build two particle state, you can build state with Avogadro number of particles within the same framework because you are now uh, uh, capable of changing number of particles using creation and annihilation operators. And that's where this has a very powerful uh, framework to deal with like condensed matter systems where you have a humongous number of particles you have to deal with. It doesn't make sense to write down the wave function with six times 10 to the 23 arguments in it. You can't possibly even deal with it, but in QFT, you find a way of dealing with that thanks to this new formulation of creating particles in a single Hilbert space. So that's the idea. So this technical part of rewriting 
the right hand side of the equation in terms of uh, 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 doing the commutator and integration of parts is something I will be asking you to do yourself. So if, not, if something is not clear to you right now, please do ask. So let me pause here. Can you please explain Adelaide? again where the um, the delta potential comes from? Yeah, so, so that came from this last term here, right? So I have psi dagger, psi dagger, psi, psi, psi dagger, psi dagger acting on mm -hmm. the, the vacuum state. So I use the same trick I used before, namely first I look at this psi and replace this psi, psi dagger by the commutator that gives some delta function. And then mm -hmm. I move psi to the right. I, I change this to the, the commutator again, that gives me another delta function. So two delta functions are added at this stage. And then psi acts directly on the, the vacuum state that vanishes so you can drop that combination. So then I have a piece, this psi is still there, but I lost one of the psi daggers together with delta function. Then I replace this psi psi dagger once again with a delta function. So suppose I use the first term, then this psi dagger is now gone by the commutator. This psi dagger still is there. Then psi, this psi dagger commutator gives you yet another delta function. So the first delta function was delta y minus x1. The second psi gives you another delta function that's delta y minus x2. Mm -hmm. And if you do it in opposite order, you end up getting the same thing so that cancels this factor of one half. So that's how you end up with lambda without one half. I'm st I still have these two psi daggers and these psi and psi daggers are all gone. They are now turned into the delta functions. So that's how you end up with this term uh, in the, uh, the, the second stage. Then mm -hmm. I perform y integral. So y is now replaced by x1. This y is also replaced by x1. That's this delta function at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So that's how in that with the delta x1 minus x2 that correctly describes interaction among particles in this uh, two body wave function. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Okay, yeah. good. Thanks. Any further questions? Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, Go ahead. Conceptually, when we were uh, learning multiple quantum mechanics, um, we didn't uh, have this delta potential, like we didn't include it in our in our Schrodinger equation, I guess. So um, uh, why yeah, didn't we so, include it then? Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent question. So delta function is sort of a uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the the uh, ideal idealized limit of whatever is the repulsive interaction among particles. So I would generalize this further when particles are interacting with, for example, something like Coulomb potential. So if you think about, for example, multi-electron atom like helium you have two electrons moving about this helium nucleus. And each electron is bound to the nucleus by the Coulomb potential, that's Vx1 plus Vx2. But two electrons would have Coulomb repulsion. So you need to include that here, that will be E squared over uh, X minus, X1 minus X2, right? So that's the Coulomb repulsion between two particles. So in general, this is not delta function, but some potential between X1 and X2. And so far, I haven't done that yet. So I have to generalize this Hamiltonian to be able to also capture the situation where you have long range potential around particles and that comes up next. So that's an excellent okay. question to you ahead of me uh, and, and you will see that uh, in a few minutes. Okay, um, just a quick follow up. So when we were doing it, I guess um, last semester we were doing helium, we just threw that term out. We said it was like too hard to work uh, with the framework we're working. So using this, we can actually like, solve it uh, with a better approximation, is that right? Um, well, so that part of uh, trying to solve this equation is actually no, no, no different from what the problem you have in, in the, uh, the quantum mechanics. So you still have to solve the problem together with the puzzle force, which is difficult. So you have to resort to various approximation methods. One of them is a variational method. And that's the first thing people try. It works pretty well. And another one is to brute force numerics. And uh, in, 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 in the, the, the computer has uh, 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 progressed so much that you can basically solve that kind of multi-body uh, the wave function, even including this repulsion uh, quite accurately numerically these days. 
and that's what chemists do on a regular uh, basis day to day uh, in, in terms of working out these uh, properties. So it's too hard analytically, that's, that's true, but conceptually it is not hard at all. And even practically, uh, there are many ways you can actually solve that equation these days. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so once you actually uh, do it yourself, you find that it's actually not as hard as you might look. So, so don't worry about that. So if you do it for three particle state, and I'm not gonna show you algebra anymore because just uh, too cumbersome, but first thing you verify that it is indeed the eigenstate of the number operator. This is a fairly easy thing to show. So if you use the creation operator three times acting on the vacuum state, so it does create a state that is an eigenstate of the number operator with the eigenvalue three. So that's the meaning of the state being three particles. And again, we take the linear superposition. Now I have a function capital of psi, which is a function of three positions, x1, x2, x3, and also time. So this function changes the function of time. And then we work out the Schrodinger equation once again and see what I get. So the left-hand side of the equation is again, just a type of derivative of this function capital Psi. Acting Hamiltonian on the state is a, a, this complicated part you have to work out. And I just did that for you here. And end result is this. Using this Hamiltonian, the same Hamiltonian as before, you find this equation down here. So time derivative of this capital Psi is given by the sum of three kinetic energies, P1 squared over 2m for the first particle, P2 squared over 2m for the second particle, P3 over 2m for the third particle. So this is the sum of the kinetic energies of three particles. And here's some potential energies for three particles. First particle experiences the potential at position x1. Second particle experiences the potential energy at position x2. Third particle experiences the potential energy at position x3. So you got all three of them. And now comes a non-trivial part. So this delta function appears in all three combinations of choosing two particles out of three. So this is the repulsion between particle one and two. This is the repulsion between particle one and three. The last one is repulsion between particle two and three. And there's no cheating going on here. Just literally acting this Hamiltonian on this state, you find these three terms which correspond to the two body repulsive potential between any pair of the particles. So this is something I mentioned, I think uh, on Wednesday, when you annihilate two particles, when you have two particles on the same side, you get n choose two, half n, n minus one, using just the normalization of states in the harmonic oscillator. If you lower it once, you get square root n, you will lower it twice, then you get square root n minus one, then you square root n minus one, square root n again, you get half n n minus minus one. So when you actually do this now as a function of positions now, rather than at the same site, you get two, three different uh, uh, combinations of choosing two particles out of three. If you have n particles, you get n choose two terms here for every combination of choosing two particles out of n. So that's the natural thing you would expect for the Schrodinger equation of n identical particles, each of them interacting through, through this two body potential uh, for each combination. And, and I think Natalie asked the question, what happens if we have a three body interaction? So in that case, you have a term that looks like psi dagger, psi dagger, psi dagger, psi, psi, psi. So three body interaction has three psi daggers in it and three psi's in it. Then again, if you work it out, you find all combinations of choosing three particles out of n and choose three terms and each one giving you the potential among three particles. So this is the way you can get arbitrary uh, 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 interactions among particles, arbitrary n-body interactions among particles, and they always come out right, namely that you get a contribution in the Schrodinger equation for choosing n particles out of m particles, and then you automatically get those terms uh, coming out of this Hamiltonian. 
So no matter what you do, what kind of interactions you got, how many particles you got, you correctly reproduce the multi-particle Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics, except that the symmetrization is built in, and also that you have the into the system. So that's the advantage we have over quantum mechanics. But for a definite number of particles, if you limit your attention to that subspace of the Hilbert space, the physics is identical because you just reproduce the Schrodinger equation, just like what you had in quantum mechanics. And the only thing that's still missing, that's what Adi was asking for, is to change this repulsive delta function potential to an arbitrary uh, long range potential, which I will do next. But apart from that, everything I hope you see is really identical to multi-particle quantum mechanics. Okay, let me pause here again to see if there are any questions on this. I see chats, let's see what's in there. Uh, my voice is scratchy. Oh, uh, do, can you hear me okay? Does the screen keep going out for anyone else? Oh, you are having this kind of problem. I think it's fine now though. It's, it's fine now? Okay, you, yeah. you, ha you had a problem for a while? Uh, it was yeah, just I'm like sure. a minute. Oh, okay, okay. So I hope uh, uh, you didn't miss much. And uh, actually the recording is done locally on my machine. So when I post a video of the lecture on YouTube later, that's a local recording. So it shouldn't have any issues with the transmission over internet. So everything should be recorded fine. Okay, any um, questions I, here? Go ahead. Yeah, um, so right now we're doing a uh, linear superposition of the position eigenstates because mm -hmm. we haven't yet introduced different energy levels. So when we introduce that, we'll be superposition over both energy eigenstates and position eigenstates. Um, well, in some sense, this is a superposition of energy eigenstates too. So this is the most general state. So it, you can capture any state for a fixed number of particles this way. So uh, in the same way that any uh, uh, state, either Hamiltonian eigenstate or the linear superposition can be written as a wave function. And if the wave function is not the eigenstate of Hamiltonian, it's not stationary state. So it evolves with time. When the wave function is an eigenstate of Hamiltonian, it changes only by a phase by e to the minus i e t over h bar. Now that's the only difference whether Hamiltonian eigenstate or not, but this psi can capture either case Hamiltonian eigenstate or not. So in the same way, this <clears throat> expression can capture both Hamiltonian eigenstates and superpositions of Hamiltonian eigenstates either way. Does that make sense? Okay, but yeah, so it has to be inside of the weighting itself. Yeah, yeah, that's right, right. Okay. So what right. weighting you choose represents whether you have chosen a Hamiltonian eigenstate or rather they are linear combinations of them. That makes sense, thank you. Okay, and that's a very good question. Any other questions here? Is it clear? Okay, so we can always come back if you uh, come up with the questions later on. So here is where I try to address the question from Adi. So here, this piece here is what ends up being the kinetic energy for each particle. So even though this is a single term in a Hamiltonian field theory, he ended Professor, up producing the kinetic energy for every particle you have in a state. Oh, go ahead. I think Sorry? the screen was blocked for a few seconds, but I think it's back now. There was, it was a problem again? Long. Now it's gone again. <laughs> yeah, now it's back. It might be, be worth it to just try stopping the share and starting it again. And here I'm trying to check the chat. Okay, let me do that then. Now I see my computers being slow. I don't know what's going on. Let me just turn off other applications to see if that would speed up this computer.
Okay, so let me start all over again. Share screen. No, it is still slow. Huh. Clearly, something is wrong. Maybe this computer Your video is seems this. very choppy too. Huh. But this is what I got for now. So let me try to continue. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's a problem with the computer for some reason. Okay. Yeah, my computer being still slow, so there's something wrong with this. Oh boy, I don't know what's going on. Okay, why do I do this? I have to restart the computer. So uh, uh, it, it may actually disconnect. Oh, I can avoid you guys getting disconnected by making one of you my co-host, right? That is, that's true. Oh, this is really slow. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna Here's a random pick, Amanda. I make you a host, so stay connected, so that everybody else stay connected. I'm gonna uh, put, uh, uh, sign off. Then we connect. <laughs>